Look who's back. Joel Embiid made his much anticipated return to action Tuesday night, taking on the Thunder his first game back since January 30th after undergoing surgery to repair a torn meniscus. The Sixers officially made him available about 30 minutes before tip off and there wasn't much drop off as the former MVP dropped 24 points on six of 14 shooting six boards, seven assists, three steals and six turnovers in 29 minutes of work. The Sixers went 11 and 18 without him and dropped to eight in the Eastern Conference standings. Now speaking of standings, here's a look at the East following Tuesday's action. The Celtics locked in that one seed with the Bucks behind it too. Now this is where things can get a little tricky down the line. The Knicks sit just a half game behind the Cavs for the three seed, with the Magic just a half game behind them. The Pacers occupy the sixth seed with the Heat, Sixers, Bulls, and Hawks all sitting in the play-in tournament. We now welcome in NBA analyst John Gonzalez and CBS Sports NBA writer Sam Quinn following Tuesday night's action around the association. And I want to begin things on the East. And fellas, I don't know about you, but 29 minutes for Joel Embiid. I didn't expect as much coming from someone who had missed two months of action and coming off knee surgery. I thought he would be a little bit more on the lighter side of a minute restrictions, but he looked understandably looked a little gas there at the end. John, what did you make of how long Embiid played and how do you analyze his performance in his first game back? Yeah, not bad for two months off, right? I mean, right. it's his first game back. He plays 29 minutes. There's some question if he would even play a single minute. There was some intrigue surrounding Joel Embiid's return. Earlier this week, there were reports that he could make his return against the Thunder. Then he was listed on the injury report as out, and he missed shoot around this morning. So everybody thought, hey, that's He's not going to make it. And then all of a sudden, 5.30 Eastern rolls around, and he's questionable. And then all of a sudden, he's go time. He's activated, and there's probably going to be an NBA investigation into that. But we'll put that aside for a second. For him to come back after missing two months and play the way he did, to play that many minutes, to impact the game at both ends of the floor, and to finish off the game by ripping a steal on Josh Giddy. Going the other uh, way on the floor, length of the floor, getting his body into Chet Holmgren, going to the line for two free throws to help win the game. It was the full Joel Embiid experience. Yes, he looked gassed. Of course he was going to be uh, having had so much time off. I was tired having watched him, but man, the Sixers <laughs> really need this guy. You can see how much better they are when he plays. Yeah, what I'd add here is, aside from 29 minutes, the numbers that really stand out, 12 made free throws, 12 attempts. Obviously, Joel Embiid is the best foul drawer in the NBA, but since he's been out, we've seen the league really cut down on whistles. If Joel Embiid can still get to the line, even hampered by this injury, at a time when nobody else can, that's such a huge advantage for the Sixers as they reach into the postseason. Hey, Sam, John said you can see how much better this team is with him on the floor. Now, with him back and potentially being healthy, how far do you think this Sixers team can go? As long as they can avoid Boston in the first round, and that's going to probably mean winning a play-in game, probably over the Heat, maybe over the Pacers. If you can get up to number seven instead of number eight, everybody else in the East is vulnerable. The Bucks lost at home to the Wizards tonight. They're 15 and 14 under Doc Rivers. They have more losses under Doc Rivers now than they had under Adrian Griffin. The Knicks don't have OG Ananobi and uh, Julius Randle. The Cavs have injuries. The Magic have no playoff experience. I think they should feel comfortable against just about anybody in the East besides the Celtics. And if they can get the Celtics in the third round instead of the first, maybe Embiid is closer to 100%, and that's a fair fight. Yeah, Sam's absolutely right. I mean, that's the whole thing here, right? I mean, people were talking about, and we discussed it on the Beyond the Arc podcast with Bill Ryder and Ashley Nicole Moss, should Embiid even come back? Well, now you see why, because of exactly what Sam just said. If you can avoid the Boston Celtics in the first round. Look, it's the Boston Celtics and everybody else in the Eastern Conference. And why can't the Sixers, if they get Joel Embiid healthy, if they get uh, his energy back under him, his legs back under him, why couldn't they be one of the teams that comes out and challenges the Boston Celtics for the Eastern Conference crown? Somebody's gonna have to play him. And you saw tonight what an impact Joel Embiid makes against a very good Oklahoma City team. Now, obviously, they didn't have SGA and Jalen Williams, but still, still a very good team. So, yeah, that's what the Sixers are thinking here. That's why they wanted to get him back before the end of the regular season. And that's why they're hoping that he'll be ready to go for the postseason.
Yeah, impactful I think is a perfect word to use, but I think looking down this stretch and as you guys say, if they can see maybe Boston in the third round, health is going to be very, very key in what they do and if they are facing the Celtics. But guys, let's switch gears and head to the Western Conference. The Nuggets managed to hang on and defeat Victor Wimbanyama and retake the top seed in the West. Following the win, though, they are now leading by a half game over both the Thunder and the T-Wolves. Now, looking at what lies ahead, six more games on the docket including a matchup against the Clippers on Thursday, a meeting with the Wolves, and a final meeting with San Antonio. John, do you think they can finish the regular season with that one seed? Yeah, I'm not betting against them right now. Those three teams at the top of the Western Conference, the Nuggets, the Wolves, and Oklahoma City Thunder, have really just leapfrogged each other all season long. So right now it's the Nuggets. I certainly wouldn't bet against them, as I said, because they are the defending champions and they do have the best player in the world. And not for nothing. I mean, they've done the last couple of games without Jamal Murray and that two man game is really killer for them, uh, especially in the fourth quarter. So they're going to want to get him back as soon as possible. But yeah, I think that the Nuggets are the favorites right now, especially with, you know, the Thunder mi missing, as I mentioned, SGA and Jalen Williams tonight. And then, you know, the Wolves still trying to keep their head above water and they have without cat they've gone eight and four so yeah i think it's still the nuggets right now yeah i'm with john on this one aside from the health of those other teams look at who denver has left on the schedule they have six games left four of them are against the grizzlies the spurs the jazz and the hawks those are very winnable games for them obviously that minnesota game is going to go a long way if the timberwolves can win that game especially with their tiebreakers they're going to be in the driver's seat for the number one seed but Denver has six games left, and we can right away say four of them are probably going to be wins. If you're starting at 4-0, and you're probably in pole position here. Yeah, and in one of those matchups also, like we mentioned, meeting up with the T-Wolves. So that'll certainly be impactful with what they're trying to do and hang on to that one seat. A favorable remaining schedule for Denver. All right, guys. Moving down in the standings, it's been a little bit of a tough road. I'd say for Sacramento, they dealt with a lot of key injuries to key players. Kevin Herter, Malik Monk, uh, they entered the night with the eight seed in the West with eight games remaining, and the Kings got that much-needed win over the Clippers. But, guys, things don't get easier for them if they wanted to get out of the play-in. Up next is a four-game road trip that includes a back-to-back -back against the Knicks and the Celtics. We already talked about how daunting that is, but Sam, what's your outlook for the Kings? Is their position pretty much set where they are right now in that play-in? Yeah, I would say they don't have much room to climb because without Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, they're just going to have such a hard time scoring. Now, to their credit, since they've gone down, especially with Keon Ellis joining the starting lineup, their defense has been fantastic. If they're going to make any noise in the postseason whatsoever, that's going to have to be their calling card. But remember, last year, this was a team with the greatest offense in NBA history by efficiency. They're not close to that. They weren't close to that with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter. Without those guys right now, they're sort of just trying to hold on and say, can we stay at seven or eight instead of falling to nine or ten? Yeah, Sam's right. I mean, this was a pretty thin team to begin with. And you have Malik Monk, all of a sudden he's out now. Uh, six man of the year candidate, total bummer for him too, especially going into uh, free agency this off season. But if you're the Kings, the timing couldn't be worse here. You're going to try to figure out how to replace that scoring. And I think it's going to be pretty difficult for them. Good win for them tonight though, right? I mean, no Kawhi Leonard for the Clippers. He returns back to LA to undergo knee treatment. Uh, and you never want to hear knee treatment and Kawhi Leonard in the same sentence, especially when the playoffs are coming up. But the Clippers right now, they have to be thanking their lucky stars that Golden State beat Dallas tonight. They should send them all a fruit basket and a thank you <laughs> note, because if they hadn't, the Dallas Mavericks, if they had pulled that game off, they would be within one game of fourth place in the Western Conference and having home court advantage in the first round, which is a big, big deal. So, yes, the Clippers lost uh, tonight, but so did the Mavericks. So could have been worse for them got a big big break right there uh, hopefully they like edible arrangements flowers I don't yeah. know but send it their way because that was much needed but going back to the Kings uh, look and I talked about playing the Knicks playing the Celtics they have matchups against Brooklyn OKC New Orleans Phoenix and Portland a lot of those teams are postseason bound teams so a tough road ahead if they want to light the beam up they're going to need to keep winning enough this way it's going to be a little tough but fellas this has been a lot of fun appreciate the insight as always thank you so much and if you want more from hoops and hoops analysis you're going to want to check out the beyond the arc podcast john is joined each and every day by ashley nicole moss and bill Ryder, breaking down the biggest storylines from around the nba the beyond the arc podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts